Hello to all our viewers around the world. Welcome to GSR, Africa's global platform. I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear, unquote. A statement by the late civil rights leader Martin Luther King. If the world is to stick with the word love in that statement, hate will never have a space in this world. The recent shooting incident in the United States is a mind-boggling situation for all. History will tell us that these incidents are not in any way new in certain communities, but why should hate be allowed to triumph? Perhaps what has gotten the world talking in recent times are those videos that went viral on social media. The killing of Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge and Philando Castile in Minnesota. But what made it even worse is the killing of the five police officers who were on duty to protect protesters on a peaceful march in Dallas deepening hatred and undermining the rule of law. So what in the world is going on? How can the black community restore trust for the police? And how can the police also understand that their mission is to serve and protect and not to kill? I will later be connecting with Inspector Ricky Virapan of the York Regional Police in charge of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Bureau. But first, I will begin our conversation with some community members to tap their knowledge on ways to correct these wrongs. Join the conversation on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and also on YouTube. Let's get started. Let's now bring in my first set of guests on JSR today. Sam Tekley is a PhD student in sociology at York University. He's African-Canadian with Success Beyond Limit, a community organization at Jane and Finch in Toronto. Phil Edwards is a former foster parent, a youth advocate, and now heads BLC, a business model designed to propel the dreams and concepts of the youth and freelance thinkers. Also joining us is Si Ching, a writer and film producer with in-depth knowledge in history. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me today on GSR. Thank okay. you very much. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Let me start our conversation by taking your view on recent uh, attacks in the uh, police service, for example, in the USA. It's quite sad because uh, just this week, three more police officers have been gunned down in Baton Rouge. What's your take on that, Sam? I mean, I think, of course, it's, uh, these, are, these are tragedies, right? These are, these are terrible events and, of course, terrible ways maybe of dealing with uh, mistrust. Uh, but also, I think we must question how uh, the legitimacy of, of the way in which policing has been operating in, in the U.S., right? And even in Canada. Think about these, these events, I, I don't think, are coming out of a vacuum. There are serious levels of, of uh, questioning police policing in the U.S., and I think more and more that's even coming here. So I think, I think while it is terrible and it is a tragedy, the mistrust and, and that, that legacy of, of what policing has represented is also coming to bear. Mm. Uh, si Chin, why this mistrust for the police? Do we know the genesis of this? Well, this stems from a long time ago. I mean, stuff like this just didn't start happening uh, recently. This goes back a long time ago. What we're seeing today is actually the fruits of an evil seed that was planted years ago. And in order for us to combat what's happening, we got to look at it at a much de in, a, in a much deeper detail. I mean, it, did, it just didn't start like that. It started a long time ago. And instead of just looking at the problem, it's like uh, uh, going to a tree, picking the fruit and eating it and says, well, the fruit's bitter and blaming the fruit. You got to blame the tree. You got to blame who planted the tree. So this is something that is, has, has been uh, uh, planted a long time ago, and that's what, what you see happening today is a result of that. When we say long time ago, uh, how do we mean? How long ago? Well, I'm talking about long time ago, colonization, slavery. I'm talking. I'm bringing it way back then. You see, when you teach a set of people that they're no good. You know, they have a tendency to act like they're no good. If you were to teach these children the truth about themselves, they might be acting differently. You see, what, what has happened is oftentimes when, when you tell children, well, you're no good, you can't do this, you can't do that, and this and that and that, you're disenfranchised, society don't like you, um, you know, you, you're not equal, you don't have equal opportunities, then it's easy for a child to run to 
different things. They get distracted by violence, uh, gangs, drugs, all different ty types of things that's out there. Um, <clears throat> mm. Unless you can stop that, you're going to always have the problem. Mm. There are so many issues. I mean, when you walk into the black community, there's so many I mean, issues that they keep raising, including uh, racial profiling. Uh, Phil, do you see racial profiling as a contributing factor to the public perception of racism within the police service? Absolutely. Uh, profiling is another one of those bad fruits. Uh, Brother Chin said it clearly. There's a lot of things that are taking place that needs to be addressed. Um, I'm glad we're in an era where we have cell phones and these things are being recorded because it's not brand new. They've been happening for a long time. It's just that we have devices to start recording and people are starting to stand up and speak up. Mm. And talk about the license to record. I think social media, you know, in a way uh, is sort of exposing all these things. I don't know if it is in the right direction or in the, in the, in the wrong direction. Uh, Sam, how can the world our communities, especially because for people like you who are leaders of your community, make sure that even though these things are spreading around, we are able to give out the best of communication in order to, you know, get the best out of this. So that instead of it degenerating in something negative, we are actually able to turn it around into something positive. Yeah, and I think I think that's happening, right? With a lot of this public, I guess, information passing around, but also that. It's just it's displaying what how these communities have been feeling about policing for a long time, right? So that that I, I guess you can call it mistrust. It's also about safety and survival. A lot of these black communities, especially in the context where I work in in, in Toronto, there's a it's a healthy mistrust, right? Because these are passed down on generations because of stories of of mistreatment at the hand at the hands of police. So to me, I listen to these stories and think about. How, how do we hold policing accountable, the institutions, our, our elected leaders? It's also by telling these stories, by sharing these videos, and also by protecting each other. So I think while, while yes, there are of course groups of, of, of black youth around the city who commit crime, but there's also lots of black youth that don't and still don't trust the police. They don't see police and say protect and serve especially in the context with whom I work, and those stories need to be told, they need to emerge, and I think that in that way we can, you know, reach a critical mass and hopefully hold policing accountable. But, but honestly, I mean, the mantra of the police service itself is to serve and to protect. It's not how people feel, to be honest. Where I work and with the groups of people that I, I, I associate with, a lot of the young people that, that, that tell me and share these stories don't feel like they see police and feel protected. You actually, they actually get nervous, you get scared. There's been stories and experiences of trauma, right? So I think, I think that is a very, very real and common experience. And, and we're seeing Black Lives Matter protests across the world, right? UK, we have some in Ghana, we have across the US and here. So there is something to that, right? There's something that is a shared experience mm -hmm. that they feel like they need to organize, get out, and literally yell at the top of their lungs that their lives matter. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to, if we're gonna be if we're going to be real and be accountable, we need to understand that experience. Mm. And, and you know what? It's legitimate. Mm. So. Chin, um, uh, mention of Black Lives Matter, how do you respond to this statement made by you know, a police uh, officer in the United States of America in Florida, Officer Jay Stallion on Facebook? He says, black lives do not matter to most black people, only lives that are taken at the hands of cops or white people matter. This statement has actually been shared over 130,000 times on Facebook. How do you react to a statement like that? That look, the black community only reacts to the issue of Black Lives Matter when a police guns down a black person. But when a black person guns down a black person, we don't talk about Black Lives Matter. Well, that's the problem I have with Black Lives Matter. Because if Black Lives Matter, it should matter. It doesn't matter who kills you. Um, we should start in our own community. We should value our own lives, our own people's lives, and stop doing the stuff that we're doing. If we can't value our lives, how are the people going to value our lives? You know, black lives matter should matter all the time, not just when other people hurt us. Because the fact of the matter is, a lot of the stuff that we do to ourselves in our community is generated from self-hate. And, and again, it goes back to the teachings. The, 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 the evil teachings, that evil seed that I was talking about. See, when you teach children that they're no good and, 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 and all these negative things about them, you're going to have what you have today, mm. right? It, it's quite interesting. I mean, because this statement made by this police officer uh, is backed by statistical evidence, which clearly shows that 
blacks are killing blacks. Well, he was right. Yeah, I mean, through gun violence than those of the, of the police, uh, police people. Uh, Phil, what's your take on that? I've yet, to meet, I've yet to meet a black man who's made a gun. Uh, guns need to go. Right? The accountability of the things that are being brought to the community. Uh, I've worked in the community for many years, and I've worked before the gun era, and I'm working during the gun era. And I really think that has changed the level of engagement. Um, it's a powerful tool, which is why officers have guns as well. And so to talk about, you know, blacks are killing blacks, there's way more. You're looking at the end result. Um, it's been stated already. We need to look at the cause, we look at the root problem, and we need to together talk about solving the problem. Uh, you cannot empower someone and tell them that, yeah, we're going to do better, we're going to be better, and there's no plan to it. So resources, education, employment, it, it all has to be a whole big holistic plan, and I believe it needs to start intrinsic. I can't be waiting for someone else, such as an oppressor, to give me something. The handout has to stop. Um, we have to rise from within. So you are, all, all you're trying to say is that gun control should be taken serious? Absolutely. Do, do we really need guns in our communities? Does a 14-year-old boy, even a 20-year-old, needs a gun for what? To what end? So we spoke about statistics. There's many countries who have a ban on guns, that not even policing are, are using guns. So guns is a huge cause, um, and I believe that North America won't get rid of guns. But the question I want to ask is, why not tranquilize our guns? Um, you know, there's so many levels to talk about policing, and we'll have that conversation shortly. But if they're going to have guns, why not have tranquilizing bullets? That way, if they make the mistakes that they're making, someone's not dead, they're just asleep. I mean, Sam, that's the solution. Sam, you wanted to come in. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think we must be critical of a response to Black Lives Matter with the question about black on black violence. Because to me, those are very two different conversations, right? So Black Lives Matter emerges out of a context, societal and within policing, it's a, it's a claim to policing and to society that these lives matter. Chen, how, how do you respond? I mean, because you had the US President, Barack Obama, come in, in to say that, look, the fact that people say that black lives matter doesn't mean that no life matters at all. What's your take on that? Yeah, black lives do matter, and, 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 and I'm not against it. I'm not a, uh, against nothing that they're doing. Because on, on obviously and honestly, if you're a white person and you hear the same things over and over again, black lives matter, then it puts you in a very sensitive corner. Why? Does it mean that my life doesn't matter in any case, in any way? We, I feel that our lives should matter to us first and foremost. I mean, I personally, I don't care if my life matters to the next man out there or the next community, as long as my life matters to me. Because in a way, you're sort of giving up power when you're, but, when but you're trying to get... But that's being selfish, Jim. Well, no, it's not being selfish. Because at the end of the day, you have to look after yourself. You have to be responsible for yourself. You can't expect other people. I mean, you know... We, and at the we, same time, be your brother's keeper. Yeah, you have to be your brother's keeper. You, 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 you have to be your brother's keeper. But what I'm saying is, if we don't take that responsibility to make our lives matter to us, how is other people going to think our lives matter? We have to show from within. We have to, sit, we have to lead by example. Um, you know, to me, I'm about lives. I'm about people dying. So I, it, it doesn't matter who kill who. Uh, the fact of the matter is in, in our community, we have a lot of gun violence. We have a lot of uh, 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 young men dying at the hands of other young men. Now that comes through uh, miseducation. That comes through self-hate. And this is what we need to look at. We need to look at the self-hate in our community and address that. Because what we're doing is we're annihilating ourselves. You know, the police killed two men, but if you look at, okay, two, two, when was it, last week or, or the week before, two guys got killed. But if you look at the number that got killed. Please specify, in the U.S. In the U.S. Now, if you look at the amount of people that got killed within that week in Chicago, it is more than those two men. Why are we going to come out just for that? We got to save lives, period. And that's what I'm all about. Black lives, saving black. It doesn't matter who kill us. We need to educate ourselves into preserving ourselves and respecting ourselves and, 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 and carry on. I mean, we can't just go on the way we're doing right now because it's, it's, we're not getting anywhere. Mm. You're watching GSR, Africa's global platform. If you just joined us, we're discussing the recent strange relations between police and the black community. We'll be right back. Welcome back to GSR, Africa's global platform. If you just joined us, we're talking about the strained relations between the black community and the police. Gentlemen, once again, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. 
Uh, Su Ching, let's describe the relations between the police and the black community. I mean, within, within the context that, look, regardless of whatever happens, we can talk about the Canadian context because if you compare it to what is happening in the U.S., it's just like comparing apples and oranges. Is it fair to say, for example, that the Canadian story is a better story? Well, it's not a better story. It's just a different story. I mean, we have our problems over here. It might not be... But, but you don't see the same killings happening in the U.S. and Canada, do you? Well, no, you don't. But you, you do have them uh, now and again. It's more regular in the United States. But, you know, uh, uh, the problem between races is not just a, a national problem or a U.S. It's a, it's a global problem. And it's perception, how people uh, teach other people about people and, and, and what we learn about ourselves. It's all a perception. And I feel that, you know, the cops, the police in the United States, they, they, they suffer from a little bit of prejudice and, and a lot of paranoia. Um, and this is why, uh, you know, they go out and they kill these uh, innocent young men, because if they weren't paranoid and prejudiced, then they would be a little bit different. Because if you look at the way they deal with other young people, um, they're not dying as, as much as we are. So it has to be a little bit of paranoia and prejudice. I like to call it the way I see it. And, you know, some people are not going to like it. But, you know, some of these cops, not all of these uh, policemen are prejudiced, but a good number of them are. And when they deal with us, they don't do their jobs. They take it personal and, you know, they uh, inject the racism into what they're trying to do. So that's why our community don't trust them. Mm. But Sam, this is a collective responsibility, right? What is your organization, Success Beyond Limits, doing to correct these wrongs? Well, a lot of the young people that we work with um, at Success Beyond Limits or SBL, we do a lot of work around education, around mobilizing in the community and organizing amongst ourselves, teaching each other safety and security, right? And sometimes, to be quite honest, that's against the police. I mean, in, in, the, in this community in Jaina Finch where I work, a lot of families, especially black families, have had conversations with their children around what do you do when you see the police? And that's out of fear, and that's out of protection and survival. So this is what is, is legitimately felt in these communities because they have these stories circulate. And the, the, the myth that in Canada it's any different uh, than in the U.S., I, I, would, I would venture to say, let's ask these young black people who feel harassed by police. The, the feeling is the same. There's been activism in this city just recently around uh, 10 City, where Black Lives Matter Toronto was on the lawn of police headquarters for almost two weeks in the cold, right? So they're doing that because these, that, that situation it exists here as much as it does in the U.S. And we've had this issue since the 70s. We've been protesting against uh, police violence, right? Mm. And, and, and the, the case, it's still just as fresh as, uh, as recently now that this issue is still prevalent and with us in Canada. And if you look at the, a lot of the videos that actually come out, a lot of these young people tend to run away from the police when they are being arrested, sort of resisting. What are parents really telling their children? It, it looks like the thing starts from the house, right, uh, Phil? You know, I think that um, the minute we ask the question and we separate Canada from the U.S., that's what media wants us to do. Uh, I'm not going to wait till it hits my family and then I'm going to start crying tears and saying, oh, it hurts. It, it hurts now. And it hurts when it's happening in the U.S. It hurts when it's happening in any country abroad. So I can't wait till it hits home. Um, it's a real problem. It's a real problem because we, do have, we are connected, um, whether we're connected by blood or we're connected just by skin or we're connected by, by airwaves. Um, I personally think right now that we have to arm ourselves and gear ourselves mentally, physically, spiritually, uh, we have to prepare. So as I was mentioning earlier, one of the reasons why I work with youth the way that I work, I can't sit and wait for a handout anymore. Um, it is clear that we are an oppressed people, but I don't even want to resist in that form of oppression. So we need to build our own entities. We need to do things that help us to strengthen from within so that I was sitting waiting for someone to have mercy or pity or say, okay, fine, we're going to treat you nicely. Mm. And, and just as recently as 2016, there was a 41-year-old black man who was shot dead by the police in Montreal in routes that had sort of occurred afterwards. But why are these killings so visible in your eyes, in your communities? You talk about it, but really the wider population do not see it as you are seeing it, uh, Sam. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, I think that's on us, right, uh, who are in these communities who are at times suffering to make that known, to make that be widely known and that that social media especially these days has helped right with so many of us having you know capturing devices and sharing it and letting letting each other know what's been going on i mean to it's media we do need media to help 
amplify these stories in these communities, especially as they are stories of, of violence and mistrust at the hands of police. But again, I think that responsibility is collective as well. Mm. And, and, and we must ask the question, or for me it always is, how, how do these lives really matter to wider society, right? Because there's that, it, it, there's so much like literally black death happening in these communities across the US and Canada, and, and the wider outrage is not there. So I, I, I wonder sometimes, yes, do these black tears and these black lives matter to wider society? when this constant death toll and, and re the repeating and repeating of, of these types of videos, I wonder, I wonder to wider society, do, do we actually matter is my constant question. And it literally sometimes even keeps me awake at night. So I don't know. Well, when you live in a community where the sirens blows every time, then you know that there is a problem somewhere, right? I mean, have you had your own experience where you feel targeted unfairly by the police, Sam? Oh, most definitely. I mean, I, I'm a young black man in the city of Toronto, so I constantly get carded. I mean, even I, I was uh, on, on, campus, on my campus at York University where I've been a student since 2002, and I've been stopped by two police officers asking me what I'm doing here. Uh, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm going to teach a class. And it, it was obvious they didn't believe me or that I was getting my PhD. And I've been in, in communities across the city where we get stopped at night, and they always tell you, oh, there's some, there was something happened in the community. We're stopping everybody which I, I find hard to believe that I constantly get the one to be randomly stopped. But I, again, I think what I think about too is, is the young people in my community who are maybe not able to articulate themselves the way that I, I do. And I can very quickly communicate to police officers that you probably don't want to trample on my human rights. So I, I'm even privileged in that sense, right? So there's a lot of young black youth who it may, not, it may not communicate in this way, it may not come out this way. And then what happens? What happens at the hands of police, right? So, so well, that's what I'm constantly nervous about. Well, I, I will be connecting with the police service uh, pretty soon. But Phil, you, you, you have worked with a number of youth yourself. I mean, youth in your community, Jane and Finch, where my understanding is that some of the youth sometimes adopt the resistance strategies. Have you come across such stories yourself? Absolutely. Uh, there are children as young as even kindergarten and grade one that when they get in trouble, young black males specifically, um, it's not just sent to the office. They're being expelled. So that rejection from school boards, rejection from police, rejection from a lot of things. Then they hit that stage where they're ready for employment, rejection there. Then they perhaps hit the stage where they're parenting and fro comes into place. There's a lot of systems that are into place that just make someone not feel that they are welcomed. I'm a father of two sons and my sons have never had to ask me, Dad, does my life matter? So this whole Black Lives Matters movement, it came because of neglect, it came because of hurt. Um, people have to identify and shout and scream, hello, we matter. And that's happening from a young age all the way up until older men. So it's, it's a real big thing and for some people to, to address it and, and, and you know, wipe it away by saying all lives matter, you're not addressing the issue. And don't you also think that you know, the police is really present in your community because really when you do the statistics, a lot of the crimes that actually happen within the city actually occur within the same vicinity. So you telling the police not to come to your communities and deal with the issue would be chaotic, isn't it? No, I'm telling the police and I'm telling every system and every service provider that if they're going to be in the community, they need to talk about their training, they need to talk about the service that they're providing. I mean, they, they go to training, they're screened in, then they take an oath. Now, if those are the three criteria to become a specific job, and we've been talking about this problem for over 30 or 40 years, and something is still failing, you need to revamp something. If I provide a business to someone and I'm failing for 30 or 40 years, I've got to do something about that. So the service that's being provided is not adequate. Si Chin, let's do some comparisons here. Uh, in fairness of all that we have discussed, is it fair, a fair statement, so to say, that policing, I mean, from the 70s and 90s, and their level of racism was higher more than it is right now. Because if you do the comparison, you realize that, look, it was way more before than it is today. Is it fair to say that? Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, you know, things certainly have changed. It hasn't really changed for the better because people are still dying at the hands of police. Um, we're still dying at the hands of and police. And so are the police also being shot? Well, the funny thing about that, uh, as I was explaining uh, to, to, to um, a policeman earlier that is here, um, you know, when you plant a seed, whatever you plant, that seed is going to, you cannot plant an apple and get a banana. And I'm not saying that these cops that are, I'm, I'm happy that, that, that they're dead. Uh, nobody should die. But, you know, when you keep kicking somebody,
kicking somebody, kicking somebody. It's like a dog. If you pass by your neighbor's fence every day and you kick, your, kick his dog, kick his dog, and you tease that dog, one day that dog is going to bite you. You know, it's just the laws of nature. And we can't just look at the problem. We have to look at the root of the problem. Yes, but, but Chen, these cannot be the basis upon which, and it's of course not justifiable, regardless of whatever is happening, that the youth will take up arms and target a police person. And I think the most important thing is when you have elderly people, you know, like you, like Phil, like Sam, and like yourself in your community, I think the major responsibility and the key role is for you to be educating these people about the role of the police. The police are always our friends. They are the peacekeepers. They are, the, the sort of, um, they are there to protect and to serve us. You understand. So how would you respond, especially when a 17-year-old man comes to you and says, look, I am being chased by the police. What is the best thing for me to do? What would your response be? Well, you know, you can teach the children how to respect police, but you also have these, these police, they need to also learn how to respect these kids. Because not all of these kids are criminal. Uh, not all of them are bad. But if you look at everybody... But if you run away when the police is chasing you, it makes you a criminal, and that's what's Well, not necessarily. You can run out of fear. You could be innocent and, and, and run away. How, why would you run when you are innocent? Well, because sometimes you get picked up by them and you get blamed for stuff that you didn't do. And I'm speaking from experience. When I was 15 years old, I was standing one night waiting on a bus, and I got arrested for robbery I didn't commit. And even after the lady came in and said that, no, it wasn't them, I still got beat by the police. So you see, when you have stuff like this happening in your neighborhood and it has happened to you, you can certainly understand how these other young people react to it. And this police problem has been a long time. I mean, we need to learn, so do they, they need to learn also. They need to learn how to deal with us because we're not the same as them. We're not the same as their children because we're, we weren't taught the same. And, and, and they need to, to as police officer, understand what we go through. You have a lot of kids out there that don't have no opportunities. They're disenfranchised. They're, 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 they're pushed out of society. And what they're doing is all that's left for them. Now, if we were to teach them and show them and accept them, maybe things would be different. Mm. Interesting submissions there. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining me today on GSR, Africa's global uh, platform. Sam Tekle is a PhD student in sociology at York University and with success beyond limit, a community organization at Jane and Finch in Toronto. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank Phil you. Edward is a former foster parent, a youth advocate. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. And Si Ching is a writer and film producer and then also very in-depth in knowledge when it comes to history. Thanks for having us. And now to the GSR question of the day. Who made the statement? There shall be no solution to this race problem until you yourself strike the blow for liberty. A. Mahatma Gandhi. B. Marcus Garvey. C. Maya Angelou. And D. George Washington. When we come back, how best should mothers and parents communicate the role of the police to their kids in order to avoid the recent unfortunate incident? I'll be joined by some mothers to share their view. We'll also be right back with more information together with our GSR question of the day. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to GSR, Africa's global platform. We're talking about ways to improve our relations with the police. Joining me now are two mothers. Ruth Mburu is an African-Canadian. She's a mother of a 14-year-old. And Evelyn Malemo is a, an entrepreneur and a mother. She actually migrated to Canada in 1997 from Kenya. Evelyn and Ruth, thanks for joining me and thanks for accepting to be on my show. Thank you for having us. Mm. Being a mother uh, in a Canadian community and seeing these things unfold just across the border, how do you feel about these videos being shared on social media? Do you uh, get worried that your kids could be seeing them? Ruth? Um, I would say it affects us uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, even if you're in Canada and it's happening in the U.S., you tend to wonder if it's going to be moving here. And with that, then it makes you prepare yourself, prepare your loved ones and tell them that probably they need to be more vigilant, they need to be more careful 
Uh, so I would say, yeah, even if it's not happening here, it obviously affects us here. Mm. And Evelyn, do you, do you feel the same sentiment? Do you, do, you, do you get worried when you see these videos, knowing that your kids, 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, could come across these videos? I am definitely very scared, but also at the same time, I have allowed my children to watch the videos as painful as they were, only because I felt that it was necessary to prepare them um, for what is really out there. Right now, they are somehow sheltered, right? Um, however, when they turn 16, 17, and they're out there in the real world, there's nothing to shelter them. So it's important for me as a mother to show them what's going on out there, to educate them and to prepare them um, for what they'll be facing. And how do you communicate this to your kids? Uh, and at the same time, educating them on how to talk to the police, knowing that if it is not done well, death could be an outcome. Evelyn. Yeah. There's, there's, I don't, there's not a right way and a wrong way to doing it. I think it's a very subjective method, um, depending on the type of child as well. And as a parent, I think it's, one of those really difficult conversations that um, I'm forced to have with my children because you know here I am teaching my children and preparing them to be great human beings great citizens and to abide by the law and yet when they go out there you know it, they could be abiding by the law but still find themselves in a really serious predicament mm. It's quite interesting because you may be, I mean, just one of those mothers educated and in a position to educate their kids on what to do, you know, when approached by the police. And how about those kids who are thought to sort of run away from police? Um, I would say that uh, you're right. We, if you tell them to run, that makes them a criminal. But then again, like somebody talked earlier in the show, they're scared of not running because... Uh, then if they are caught, probably they'd be told they were doing something which is wrong. I would say as a mother, the best thing to do, or if you know somebody, communicate to them, like if maybe they are your neighbor or your, your sister's children or just a family friend, tell them that uh, if you've not done anything wrong, just stand and try and listen to what they are saying because if you run, then chances are even if you've not done something wrong, then they think you've done something wrong. It's easier said than done, yes, but we need to communicate and we need to let our kids know that chances of them probably dying or being in the system are more if you try and run because uh, they always say the guilty are afraid. But uh, I would also say that as police, and uh, um, you need to also probably teach the community and people how to act when you approach them because you know what you need to do for the people but we don't know how we need to act right for you to not to to take us in a, in custody probably right so i would say try and educate the community as well on how on what actions to do when they are when they are caught right or when you want to approach them and ask them something let me ask you a personal question. Uh, what, how do you react, you know, when the police stops you, especially when you're driving and the police stops you? Do, do you get scared sometimes? Frightened, in a way, Ruth? Yes, you do, because uh, you always... Why? Knowing, knowing very well that you're right. Everything about, I mean, about you is right. Why do you get scared? You still get scared because you've had stories and, and, uh, and you know that if... You don't know why you're being stopped, right? The first thing that goes into your mind is like, probably I've done something wrong. Maybe I'm not driving on the right side. Maybe over, I'm driving too fast. Maybe, oh, maybe somebody said they saw my car somewhere, right? So the first thing you do is you're on the defensive, right? But I think that we should just try and listen. Probably they're just also doing their job by checking if, your everything is okay or by maybe making sure oh they said they spotted this car in a certain place they just want to confirm so i think both of us have uh, have responsibility on how we act you mean both the police stop. and parents exactly because uh, the police probably they're just trying to do their job right but i'm also scared 
because I'm I'm scared. I don't want to I don't want to be told that I'm doing something wrong. So I think the best thing for us all to do is let each other know that uh, maybe the police should let people know that every time you're stopped, it's not because you're being stopped because you've been picked on, but probably yeah, he he needs to do his job, and we and you should also know that when we we are scared and we are running it's not because we are we've done something wrong maybe we are just afraid right hmm. and, and evelyn have you been stopped by the police before oh yes i have <laughs> and um any altercation with the police um no. exchange of words no no never any exchange of words um i have tried my best to keep my hands on the steering wheel until the officer approaches me and um it's always been very very smooth um and how, where did you learn this attitude to keep your hands on the steering wheel when you're stopped by the police because this is an example that a lot of people do not know uh, uh was it was it because of your upbringing were you taught at home or where um i was not, i i, I it, somehow just started just like that. It's just instincts, right? Um, you watch and you're told whenever the, the police is coming to stop you, um, stop, put your hands on the steering wheel. Until they come, they talk to you and you just look at them and you say, yes, sir, no, sir, until they ask you to move and then you move your hands, right? But um, right now, it's so much so that if a police pulls me over at this moment in time, I'm really scared. I'm thinking, should I breathe? Should I move? Should I sneeze? Because I don't know what they're going to react. And as much as it's happening in the United States and not necessarily here in Canada, um, things that happen there do have a way of creeping up here. And you know, we're, we're, we're the same culture and it just merges together. So it's important to just protect yourself right? Stand there and protect yourself. Interesting submission there. Um, Ruth Mburu, African-Canadian, thanks for joining me. And Evelyn Malemo, an entrepreneur and a mother, thank you so much for joining me today on GSR. And stay safe and keep training our kids pretty well. Thank That's you. That's the way to go. When we return, we'll wrap up our conversation with Inspector Ricky Virapan of the York Regional Police Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Bureau. What is the police service doing to gain back trust from the black community? What is the weight of being a police officer considering recent incidents in the USA? And how does the service take this whole issue of Black Lives Matter? Inspector Ricky Virapan joins me right after this break. There is no contradiction between us supporting law enforcement making sure they've got the equipment they need, making sure that their collective bargaining rights are recognized, making sure that uh, they're adequately staffed, making sure that they are respected, making sure their families are supported, and also saying that there are problems across our criminal justice system, there are biases, some conscious and unconscious, that have to be rooted out. That's not an attack on law enforcement, that is reflective of the values that the vast majority of law enforcement bring to the job. But I repeat, if communities are mistrustful of the police, that makes those law enforcement officers who are doing a great job and are doing the right thing, it makes their lives harder. Well, U.S. President Barack Obama there giving some statistics after five police officers were killed on duty in July 2016. Why this tension? I'm joined now by Inspector Ricky Virapan of the York Regional Police in charge of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Bureau. Inspector Virapan, thanks for joining me on GSR. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm sure you've been listening in to our conversation. What do you make of the public perception out there about the police and racism? Well, these are some interesting times that we're in. And, um, you know, uh, I tell you, it, you we, we, we can view this as a, uh, as a challenge because certainly there are many, many challenges to, uh, to uh, community police relations right now. But, but I prefer to look at it as an opportunity as well 
And I think if we, if, if we try to find the opportunities within these challenges, there's multiple opportunities. And I think it has to do with uh, identifying some very, very critical issues that are, that are incumbent uh, uh, in our communities right now, as well as finding uh, ways to proceed and to, and to have dialogue and to move us ahead on mm -hmm. these issues. Uh, is this the best time to be a police officer, knowing very well, I mean, what is happening in the USA? I mean, police are being gunned down everywhere. W what comes to mind when you hear these news? Well, I, 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 I can speak for myself. Yes, as, a, as, as a member of York Regional Police, and I, I, you know, certainly, you know, the, 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 the system in the United States is very different from the system in Canada, the politics, the, 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 the society, the, the laws. There are, there are many, many differences. Although there are many things that could be deeper underlying issues that certainly we all, we all share and, uh, as, uh, you know, in, in many parts of the world. Um, but I think uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of challenging times, certainly it is, it, it, there's, there, there's so much going on, there's, there's, uh, there's many, many discussions, there's many, there's many narratives, there's many world views that are all intersecting right now. And I think it's critical that uh, we recognize this as a very, very important time for dialogue with all people at the table and, uh, in, in, in order to help us move ahead. Mm. I listened to an interview on CBC with the president of the Winnipeg Police Association and he, for example, indicated that he, he doesn't or didn't even see racism within the police force at all. So why this public perception if racism does not exist within the police service? Well, you know, um, I mean, policing is a, is, a, uh, is a profession that you see all across Canada, you, you, uh, many different communities. Police officers are, are, are human beings like everyone else. Police officers have families, are members of the community. The, the, the profession that, that many of us have chosen is policing. And certainly, uh, like, like, like all humans, we, have, we, we are not a perfect, uh, 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 we are not perfect. There are, there are mistakes that people make along the way, and, and policing is no different, mm. as you'd find in any, any, in any, in any other sectors across society. Mm. Uh, Inspector, if you could speak up a little bit for me, I would really appreciate sure. it. But um, let's take it this way. There are those who say, especially if you listened into the conversation that I had, they keep saying that, look, these trusts are not things that actually just happened overnight. It is being a systematic buildup. And it looks like the community basically failed to address them. Well, certainly, you know, uh, you know the way the way policing was done in the 1970s, as opposed to the way policing was done in the 80s and the 90s. There have been many changes. There has been there has been progress, but they are they are also we are still dealing with some of the very same issues that we've been dealing with since the 1970s. So, you know, um, our, our approach is is really. Uh, it's it's about looking through uh, looking at policing. Policing should be looked at through the lens of human rights. So human rights really forms the foundation of, of, of everything that, that we should be doing in policing. Uh, the guiding principles under the Police Service Act talk to, talks about human rights as a fundamental principle on which policing should be based. So you know we have many, like I said, we have many dis discussions and many worldviews and many narratives right now that are intersecting on some very very critical issues. And I think as a starting point, we need to be doing that through the lens of human rights because because human rights appears to be the only common language uh, which, which, which applies to all people. You know, we are, as a, as, as a society, and I'm, and I'm not talking policing or, or any particular groups in, uh, any groups in particular, but I'm saying just as, as human beings, we are so good at differentiating ourselves and always finding ways to, 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 uh, to, uh, to create divides between, between groups of people. But we seldom focus on the similarities that we have. And sometimes I think that's, that's a, a good starting point, to, to look at some of those common aspirations that we have as members of the community, regardless of our occupations, regardless of our professions, but really have a, as a common starting point to start dialogue and to start building on it. Because when we start, when we start with uh, trying to have dialogue from a position of, of distance and where there's voids and gaps, it's very, very difficult. That's right. I mean, there are those who actually say that it is paramount, for example, for there to be a separation between culture and institution, and that until that is done, there would always be, I mean, this misunderstanding and perception. How do you respond to that? How has culture contributed to what we're seeing today? Perhaps you may be from another country, I may be from another country, perhaps what is being done in my country and how things are done in my country may be different from yours. But the moment we come to Canada and we all gather, it looks like we should be ready and prepared to adopt the same culture, isn't it? Well, certainly, I, 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 think, I think culture is very important. I mean, we, we, we look at culture as, 
as, as I would understand it, as the sum total of the learned way in which people live. So culture is all-encompassing. It's everything, it, it's our identity, it's core identity, it's who we are, it's everything that we do is a, is a, um, is a you know, is a result of, of, of who we are and, and, and our cultures. So when, when, you have, when you have people who come to Canada in, in, um, from, from places around the world where policing historically has, uh, there's been mistrust and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, has, and has had to uh, define its legitimacy in the lives of people, then certainly there's, you know, when we, when we have people who come to Canada as newcomers uh, and uh, who may have through their life experience, experienced some of the atrocities uh, in policing, then uh, certainly there's going to be some of that residue that we we're going to see over here. Yeah. But that's, that's for people who come from other parts of the world. Yeah. But in light of what's been happening in North America over uh, some period of time right now, I think we also have to look at, at policing in North America. And there are some very uh, contentious and persistent issues that have been, again, as have been around since the 70s and have not been fully addressed and we need to focus on those and, and have the dialogues. And again, I see this as an opportunity and, you know, w with all of the challenges that, that this brings, but there are incredible opportunities here to move ahead on this dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we, we need to differentiate between, between uh, anti-police and anti-police brutality because I am anti-police brutality. I, I grew up in South Africa, in Johannesburg. Uh, my family lived under the apartheid system. During the I apartheid never, era? I never would have become a police officer. In fact, I left South Africa with the intention of never ever becoming a police officer. Uh, and here I am, 28 years into my career as a member of York Regional Police. Um, I believe policing is a noble profession. Certainly there are people who, who sometimes uh, make the mistakes and um, and, and contravene some of the rules and the regulations and the procedures and things that we have in policing, but everyone has to be accountable. No one is above the law. This is, the, this is, this is why we live in this incredible country. So no in, one is above the law. So, Inspector Virapan, how do we get the civilian, uh, and I'm talking about the black community, to believe and understand that the police and the civilians basically are both equal under the law? Because the feeling out there is that equality is not there. You have the badge, you have the gun, you have the power to shoot at any given point in time, and so the mistrust is deepening in a way. How do we restore the trust? How do we get people to understand that, look, the police is there to protect and to serve you? Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I, think, and I think this is something that, again, that we've been, we've, we've been trying to work on for, for a very, very long time. And, uh, and to me, it all starts with education. It, it's about education. It's about knowing your rights, and I would say to young people, uh, all across, all across our province, all across the country, know your rights. Learn about the law. Let us create opportunities where people understand what 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 the law entails. What what are your rights as a as a citizen in, in this country? And and, and, it's, and it's available. There's there's many there's many different mediums for people to obtain that. I would say that's a first step. The other thing that we we should we should be doing, I believe. Is um, is separating people from the problem. Like so, we have a we have we have issues. We may not agree with with, with each other. We may not agree with personalities with with groups, but but we don't disregard all of that. We we don't disregard someone's personality and and, and in the process disregard the, the very critical issues that are that are being uh, expressed. So we need to we need to we need to separate that. We need to focus on the problems and, and, and not the personalities. We need to focus on the message and not the messenger. The message is what's important because that's really going to help us uh, understand. The the second step then is to focus on the on the interests. Uh, sorry, to focus on the on the interests and not the positions and not the tactics. People have all different, many different ways of expressing themselves, especially in these contentious times, uh, when you have such very provocative issues that that uh, that focus on the on the safety and the well-being of our community and the welfare of, of our communities. So we need to we need to be looking at the deep-rooted issues. Uh, Mr. Chin made a very very good point when he talked about he, his, his perspective is 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 looking beyond the, the 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 center of conflict. What are the tributaries that lead to that? that bring us to that point and how do we affect change in those areas that's the second thing the third thing i would say is for communities to when 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 in dialogue 
uh, generate options for mutual gain because it's about all of us. It, 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 you know, it, it, this is not a win-lose and it's not us and them. It's about our community. We need to all take ownership and we need to all be offended when, when human rights and social justice are violated. We, we, it's, it's collective. Uh, so when Mr. Chin talks about that, that broad approach where you're looking at socio-economic issues, there are many factors that contribute to the, to the position where we are today. So we need to take a broad approach and find opportunities for mutual gain. So there's no, it's not, uh, it's not a competition. It's about healing our, our community and our society. And then the fourth thing is to have a system where we can, where we can base all of these outcomes on something that's fair. And, 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 and from my understanding, human rights legislation provides that system. So we need to do all of this through the lens of human rights. Something that is accepted, that is equitable, that, is e that, that, that talks about fairness, and that talks about inclusion for all people. What's the level of fear among yourselves as police officers, knowing very well that you know, there is a section of the community who have the notion that they are not being treated right? Is there fear sometimes as a police officer? You know. Um, the, the general profession of, of, of policing is, uh, is really sometimes uh, uh, exposing, uh, being exposed to, to very dangerous situations. So, you know, there's, there's, there, there, certainly there's, uh, there's, there's concern uh, because uh, this, this is not, this is not how, how things should be. Uh, you know, uh, policing, as I said, is a, is a very noble profession. And uh, I, chose, I, chose, I chose policing because I am an advocate for human rights and social justice balanced with due process and rule of law, not because I'm against that. And uh, so when I, look at, when I look at my profession and I look at some of my, my colleagues in the profession, certainly there's a lot of concern because how do we, how do we uh, heal, how do we heal these wounds within society? Uh, while, while trying to heal these wounds, certainly we have to be doing our jobs, we've got to be out there uh, uh, safeguarding communities, uh, creating opportunities for people to go about their business without uh, any threats to their safety and security. And there are many, many police officers, multiple police officers across the country that, that, that come to work every day, that leave their families, that come to work every day uh, just to do, do their jobs because this is their calling. And, uh, you know, and with all respect to, to all of those officers out there, certainly these are challenging times and, and, and affects us and affects uh, me as a police officer because I'm also a father, I'm also a husband, I'm also a member of the family, and most importantly, I'm a member of the community as well. Well, interesting. Inspector Ricky Virapan of the York Regional Police, I really do appreciate your time. For joining me today on GSR, I actually wish you well, you know, in your endeavor and in your quest, of course, to bring this cordial relations between the black community and the police service. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. And now to the GSR question of the day. Who made this statement? There shall be no solution to this race problem until you yourself strike the blow for liberty. A. Mahatma Gandhi. B. Marcus Garvey. C, Maya Angelou, and D, George Washington. And the correct answer is B, Marcus Garvey. My recommendation this week is this insightful book by Kianga Maha Taylor, From Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. This book surveys the historical and contemporary ravages of racism and persistence of structural inequality, such as mass incarceration and black unemployment. And thank you to all our viewers around the world for being part of today's edition of GSR. Join our conversation on social media platforms, on Facebook, on Twitter, as well as on YouTube. This has been GSR, Africa's global platform. Thanks for your company.